thanks for coming today for the second lecture. Um, uh, so as I said at the start of the last lecture, there was a typo on the program, right? So it's, I'm not going to talk about evolutionary models of decision making with large scale online experiments. Sorry, <laughs> people who are here for that. Talk about evaluating models of decision making. Um, coincidentally, there are actually two cultural evolution experiments in my presentation, so it'll all work out okay in the end. Um, so uh, yesterday I talked about how ideas from computer science can be helpful in helping us make models of human behavior. What I'm going to be focused on today is how those ideas from computer science can help us in developing methods that we can use for actually understanding that behavior. Um, and uh, you know, I think part of the motivation here is that if you look at how research is done in psychology, it hasn't changed a lot over the last century. So this is the first psychology lab. This is Wilhelm Wundt sitting here. This is their sort of fancy uh, experimental apparatus. Um, you know, uh, they had, in this case, trained observers come to the lab and sort of participate in these tasks. They'd record information about how they did. They'd use that to evaluate different hypotheses they had about behavior. Uh, if you walk into a psychology lab today, that doesn't necessarily look that different. Maybe it looks something like this. <laughs> um, but the fundamental methods that we use are kind of the same in terms of you know, trying to design experiments that might have a small number of conditions that are contrasting different uh, you know, consequences using different kinds of stimuli against one another, you know, and trying to boil things down to the simplest possible version of something that allows us to test our hypotheses. Um, but over the last decade or so, there's been a, a bit of a change in, in psychology as we're able to use online methods for collecting data, things like Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific, that allow us to just get much more data. Right? So um, it's possible to use these kinds of services to recruit hundreds or thousands of people in a much shorter time period, the time it would take us to run a traditional you know, in-person experiment it's far greater than the time it takes us to run an online experiment. And the number of participants we can have is far greater than the number that we could have in a, in a physical laboratory. And so that sets up an interesting question, which is how do the theories and methods that we use for understanding the mind change if we have much more data, right? And I think you can get uh, an intuition here, right? So I think the way that a lot of psychologists use these methods, that you use these tools is, is to take the same experiment that they would have run in the lab, but put it online and get their data that much faster. But in fact, my thesis in this talk is going to be that we can instead really change the kinds of questions that we ask as a consequence of having access to much more data. That there's, there's not just a sort of a shift in the quantitative strategies that we use for collecting data where we should just be doing the same thing, but maybe a bit faster or with slightly larger sample sizes, but that having much more data is going to fundamentally change the kinds of questions that we can ask and even the kinds of theories that we develop as a consequence. So I'm going to talk about um, three consequences of just having more behavioral data available to us. Uh, and they're, I'm going to use some case studies to, to try and illustrate you know, um, in these different uh, contexts like what the consequences of these sort of larger amounts of data are for the kinds of questions that we could ask. So I'm going to talk about experiments where we're able to use much more naturalistic stimuli than those that we would use in a traditional psychology experiment. Experiments where instead of focusing on a small number of conditions, we actually just like run all of the conditions all at once. Uh, that creates new problems. Now we have much more data for us to try and make sense of. And so we use some methods from machine learning to do that. And then I'm also going to talk about experiments where we take advantage of the fact that we're able to recruit many more participants to take the kinds of methods that we're used to using for running experiments with individuals and now run them with groups or even sort of like simulating small scale societies to allow us to investigate social phenomena. And so um, in each of these cases, I'm actually going to talk about problems that have uh, sort of underlying decision problems, although there's going to be much less emphasis on sort of models of, well, There'll, there'll be less emphasis on uh, decision making. You have to use your imagination a little more to connect these things to, to economics. Okay, so this first case of using more naturalistic stimuli, um, this is really uh, um, motivated by a, a thing that you see in a lot of uh, classical cognitive psychology. So for example, if you read the psychological literature on categorization, looking at how it is that people learn to, uh, learn to represent categories, you're reading a literature that's about these kinds of things, right? So if you run a categorization experiment, um, you might use experimental stimuli that looks like, like this, 
right? Or like this, or like this, or like this. They're things that are far removed from the kinds of things that we actually learn to represent, you know, categories uh, in, in the real world. So the reason why psychologists have used these kinds of stimuli is that they make it possible to take this complex phenomenon of categorization and boil it down to something which we can study in the lab with small amounts of data, small numbers of participants, and small numbers of trials, right? Uh, so for example, the stimulus, um, the way this works is you have a circle that has a line in it. The line can change in orientation. The circle can change in size. That gives you two dimensions uh, that you can use to then represent all of the stimuli in this space. And then you can construct different kinds of structures of categories in that space very easily. And you can use that to investigate what kinds of category structures people can learn. Um, so all of these are sort of stimuli that have been used in classic studies of, of human category learning. Um, but if you have access to much more data, then that gives you the opportunity to try and figure out how it is that category learning actually works with you know, the sort of stimuli that have the complexity of real naturalistic objects that we actually learn from. And so this is an example from a recent study that we did where uh, we collected people's categorization data for 10,000 natural images that are organized into 10 categories. These actually come from um, a computer vision data set called C510. Uh, and so what this allowed us to do was look at for all of these uh, images, how it is that you know, people actually categorize these images where we can use both naturalistic images and naturalistic categories. And so these are organized here into these 10 different categories and for each of those categories and by the entropy of people's decision about which class they belong to. So some of these things here are sort of unambiguously dogs. Some of them are far more ambiguous. But that gives us much more information about how it is that people are representing the world than using these relatively low dimensional stimuli. Um, and so this is just an example to, to kind of motivate you know, uh, what it means to use more naturalistic stimuli. Um, the way that we run these experiments is we show people a stimulus, they have to select a category. From that, we get a lot of information about the ambiguity in the stimuli. And now we have this massive data set <coughs> where if you want to run experiments that look at you know, people's uncertainty about uh, how, what categories things belong to, or you can use that uncertainty in the context of studying something else that you're interested in, we now have this massive data set of 10,000 images that have associated uncertainty with them. Um, so I'm not going to talk about what we done with this particular data set much, but I said, you know, this is sort of to motivate thinking about naturalistic stimuli. The case I'm going to focus on more is coming back to the example that I was using throughout my talk yesterday, right? So you might have felt there was a little bit of a bait and switch where I sort of started out saying, here are these amazingly complex things people do, and I used the example of chess. And then in the talk, we sort of got to these incredibly complex things that people do, which are these very small scale planning problems. Um, and the motivation for us using these small scale planning problems is really the same motivation as you know, psychologists using those low dimensional stimuli to study categorization, that it gives us a lot of experimental control and we can actually sort of figure out the, the optimal strategies in these settings and so on. Uh, and when I started working on planning, I, I've used these examples of people playing chess for you know, uh, you know, almost a decade now, uh, and I never thought that we would actually be able to um, <coughs> do any work on human chess playing because ev it's an incredibly complex problem, right? So the, the big challenge that you have when you're um, trying to work with uh, a game like chess is that you have a huge state space. If you think about the game, right, the state space of chess is given by the number of possible positions of all of the playing pieces. Um, uh, and so that's something which is sort of like a, a massive combinatorial state space. Uh, and it's really hard to say in those contexts, you know, what is the right thing for people to do, right? So we, we, we need to have a good sort of model of what optimal behavior would look like in those settings. And so for those reasons, it just seemed intractable to do that. And we were happy doing these kinds of experiments that we could do in the lab using these small scale planning problems. So over the last few years, two things changed. Um, one is we have superhuman AI systems that can play chess. Um, and for all intents and purposes, you can take the responses that those AI systems give you as kind of the ground truth, you know, correct answer to the move that you should make in a particular situation. Um, they also produce output that we can use to identify um, uh, something like a value function for different chess positions. And so you can think about that as massively reducing the dimensionality of this problem 
where instead of now having to think about sort of abstract representations of all of the states of a game of chess, we can think about representations in terms of this lower dimensional quantities that come out of our AI chess engines. And the other thing is that um, uh, chess has become extremely popular, in particular people playing online chess. Uh, and there's at least one chess website called Lee Chess, which releases every single game that's played on its chess servers. And so at this point, there's a data set of about 4 billion uh, chess games. So for people who are interested in you know, human decisions, that's a data set of around 400, mil uh, 400 billion human decisions, right? It's a massive data set. We can ground those decisions in correct actions or in values using these AI chess engines. And it presents a huge opportunity for actually trying to study aspects of human decision making. So we've used uh, those data in the context of the kinds of problems that I was talking about yesterday, where one of the things that we were interested in yesterday was understanding whether people are sort of appropriately sensitive to the value of computation. So when you're trying to decide what you're going to do next, whether you've thought enough, how much you should think you know, uh, before you take an action, uh, that's something that we can now quantify in the context of these chess games, and there's enough data that we can use to actually resolve people's policies with respect to the value of information. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Evan Russick, Dan Costa Kane, Bas Vanofferson, and, and Marcelo McCann. So the way that we operationalize the value of planning in chess is by using one of these AI chess engines, it's something called Stockfish, um, to quantify the relative value of the moves that you get pursuing two different strategies. So the way that these AI chess engines work, um, there's a few different sort of flavors of these engines, um, but most of them have a component which is a component that provides an evaluation for a board position and a component that does planning. And so planning here is the sort of like, you know, standard sort of tree search, looking ahead into the future, figuring out what the best move is gonna be, making assumptions about your opponent making the best response. And so what we can do is uh, turn that planning component on or off essentially. So when you run Stockfish, you can make a choice about the depth to which it plans. And so we ran that algorithm in two modes. One where it's making a decision about the best move just based on the evaluation of the board positions one step into the future. So it's basically just sort of considering the consequences of executing each move and then choosing the move that results in the highest value board position. Uh, and then the other which considers the best move that you would get if you plan 15 steps out into the future. So when you ask it what's the depth on move, does it also give you this score, this yeah. utility associated? Um, so, so what we measure, so the, 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 well, it, 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 what we get out of it is <coughs> um, a position, and then the way that we're going to evaluate those positions is actually by using the depth 15 evaluation, right? So when you run out to depth 15, we get a score, and then I'm gonna translate all of those scores into units, which are expressed in terms of the probability that you win the game from that position, right? So for all the board positions, we can calculate. And the program tells you that. Uh, the, the program gives us something which we can translate into that. So basically, because we have so many games, we can get the program score for each position, which is expressed in like center pawns, which is like the you know, sort of chess metric for relative advantage. We can take that measure of relative advantage and we can actually map it by a like, logistic regression to the probability that you actually win the game given that you have a particular center point advantage. And so the units that I'm gonna use for expressing utility here are uh, the probability that you win from that position. And that, that logistic regression is something you did mm -hmm. using a database of many games. Yep. So yeah, and, and most of, I think everything I'm gonna present is based on analysis of 12 million games. So it's not, we're even using just a tiny portion of this giant data set. Um, so, uh, so, so that's so here. This is this is sort of showing um, the uh, the utility <coughs> calculated at a depth fifteen evaluation, measured in terms of the probability that you win the game from that position, for say the best depth one move and the best depth fifteen move in this particular board position. So this turns out to be a board position where uh, there is a big advantage to planning, right? So if you don't plan, you just take the best single step move. You capture this pawn, uh, which you know it's good. You got a pawn, right? Um, but the thing that you miss is that once you do that, there's a, a checkmate that can happen, where this rook comes across, checks the king, and this queen can come down, uh, and then check the king again. And so there's a, a checkmate that happens. I think about seven moves into the future. 
right? And so if you plan 15 steps ahead, you can recognize that and you can move your queen here and initiate a, a, a queen sacrifice uh, and, um, uh, or you can trade a queens and then as a consequence, you end up getting out of that problem and you get sort of back to a relatively even board position. So this is a, a, a case where if you're in this situation, planning is extremely worthwhile, right? Sitting there and thinking about it for a little while can help you catch the fact that you potentially missed something which could have a big consequence for your plan. This is a, a board position where there's no advantage to planning. So in this case, the move that you make, whether you plan or not, is exactly the same move. There's this hanging knight here. You should take the knight and you're done, right? Um, and that's just such a big advantage uh, that it's worth doing. Even if you plan 15 steps into the future, you can't plan anything better than that. Yeah? When, when the program was assigning uh, utilities or pro probabilities of winning, it's assuming that it's playing <laughs> Exploit. That yeah. Exploit, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and there's lots of options now in terms of um, engines that you can use. So yeah, so we're, as I said, we're sort of treating um, like depth 15 stockfish as our sort of ground truth, right? Where it's like the best play against the smartest opponent. Um, uh, there's um, another chess engine that's called Maya, which was explicitly developed to approximate human play at different levels of expertise. And so you can use that to um, you know, try and set up sneakier <laughs> planning policies where you're taking into account the level of expertise of your opponent. Okay, <clears throat> everyone gets the basic idea? So we're gonna use this AI chess engine now to get this measure for every single board position of uh, how valuable it is to plan in that position. Um, and so this is a, a kind of oracle measure, right? It sort of tells us, like, you know, knowing um, uh, the best positions, you know, sort of like we, we can we can work out uh, as a consequence of having done a bunch of planning whether it was worthwhile to plan in that position. But it kind of gives us this measure of uh, whether this is a, a situation where you know it was actually in retrospect good to plan. And so now what we can do is compare those uh, th that measure of whether it's worthwhile planning in a given board position with how long people spend thinking in that board position. So in this chess data set, we have not just the moves that people make, but how long they spent thinking about them. And so when we plot this increase in board position advantage as a consequence of planning against move time, uh, we see a particular relationship. And so just to explain what's going on here, so every one of these plots is board position advantage versus move time. These little numbers on the top correspond to different time conditions under which you can play chess. So on this website, these are all of the different time conditions. Um, so uh, 60 here means uh, 60 seconds. So each player has 60 seconds to make all of their moves. And then plus zero means you don't get any additional seconds after each move, right? And so this is a very, very fast game. Uh, this is a very slow game. Um, most people on this server like to play fast games. Um, and then for each of these plots, you can see uh, how many games are going into the calculation of the, this relationship for, um, uh, for each of these time settings. So the main thing that you should see though is that regardless of the time setting, we see this relationship that actually has this remarkably conserved shape, right? Where as board position advantage increases, as the value of planning increases, the time that people spend thinking about that position increases as well. And so this is my, I said yesterday, you know, having done the externalized version, this is my internalized version of looking at whether people are sort of intelligently thinking about how much they plan. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so um, one interesting thing about this, so this scales with the time conditions appropriately. The other factor that scales it is expertise. So the other thing that we can do in this data set is we can look at the um, expertise of the players because every player has a score, which is called an um, ELO score, which is their uh, relative ranking relative to other players on the website. And so that's a, a measure of expertise, right? So you know, 1,000 is sort of like, a beginner, 2,000 is an expert, um, and we can look at how the size of the effect that I was showing on the previous slide changes as a function of expertise, and what we see is that, in fact, you get a, um, uh, a significant increase in the size of that effect with expertise. So people who are better chess players are better at using that signal of uh, whether they should be planning or not in that 
I should be more precise here. So um, we removed uh, the so so because um, openings and end games are very stereotyped. We removed openings and end oh, games from okay. our accounts. Okay, so this is this is all mid game. All mid game. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So you so you can think about it as yeah the, the so slope is for more x mm -hmm. correct yeah 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 so what I'm plotting here is is the the effect size that's measured like the slope of that relationship yeah so what does this chess engine do in the previous plot does it also think longer the for when it's not complicated the chess engine always thinks the same amount of time so then people are if, yeah. if we take chess engine literally as the truth mm -hmm. then people are very far from the truth well because so so mistake. no this is this is if you remember mistake. my planning result before right. Uh, I said people show an adaptivity that you don't see in the computer science planning algorithms, and that is the case here. The people are sensitive to how much they should plan in a way that the planning algorithms are not. Right. So if you run depth 15 stockfish, it's always planning out to depth 15. But you told it to do that. Um, there, there is research on uh, adaptive planning uh, in chess, but um, you know, I think our results suggest that people actually do this in a relatively Way. So one of the things that we're actually doing is taking this big data set that we now have and using that to train a neural network model that can predict these delta values directly from board positions. So using the same technology that's used in the chess engines. So, so I, I, I didn't mention this, but I said the chess engines have these two parts, a value part and a planning part. The value part nowadays is just all giant neural networks. And so we can use that same neural network architecture. Instead of calculating the value of the board position, we can calculate the value of planning in that board position and then use that to modulate planning in the system. Okay. Um, so, so I showed you this relationship. And I said we have this sort of very stereotyped form for this relationship. One question that you could have is why it has that particular form. Um, and it turns out that the form of this relationship isn't an accident, it's actually a direct consequence of the structure of the, um, the time cost in the game of chess. And so I can sort of show you this just by using a very simple model. So if you remember at the start when I started talking about chess, I said one of the big challenges of chess is you have the giant state space. In order to make this something we can study, we need to have a way of reducing that state space. This is the maximally reduced state space version of the game of chess, right? Um, and so these uh, look like simulations. These are actually data. Uh, and what they're showing is if we take a chess game, we reduce it down to these two things. One is how much time you have left in the game, and the other is the board position advantage that you have at that moment. Right? So you know, if we just sort of take the game of chess and boil it down to its sort of lowest dimensional format, the lowest dimensional format is this. It is a game where you are trying to make a decision about how you're <coughs> going to trade off board position advantage versus time, right? Like the decision to think more is I'm willing to take a hit in time because I have a, a hope that I'll get some in increment in board position advantage. So how come some, some of them play back to the right at the top? Um, like the 180 yeah. plus Z. So, so, they, so they all have this shape, right, where you can see it. So what, so what I'm plotting here is this is the actual win probability um, uh, as a function of these two factors, board position advantage, which is agnostic to time, and then time. Um, and so what you should be able to see here is like each of these games in different time conditions has these two modes. You know, above this line here, say, uh, you have this nice sort of correspondence between board position advantage and win probability, right? But then as you get towards the end of the game, you can see that everything condenses down to the side. And what this is saying is that um, as you get to the point where you're running out of time, um, you don't care so much about small increments in board position advantage, right? Like if you're not already all the way over here on the right, you're not going to win the game. But I was thinking about, the, I was yeah. thinking about that at the top. If you look at the 180 <coughs> yeah. plus zero, the 180 plus zero, the middle one at the top row, the the curve does the um, oh this the oh I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. I, so that's saying. And, and several of them show. Sure yeah, that's right. Just at the very top. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting it's observation. Kind of rough, so people yeah. think they have more time. Than yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's the. It's actually. I mean, this could. This could be catching. Um, 
openings or something like that, right? It could be catching the tail end of openings where this could be a signature of somebody having an automated series of moves that they're executing, uh, that um, uh, and that's a clue that they're more of an expert, right? But yeah, that's the, I, I had a note that before. Okay, all right. So the cool thing that we can do is actually we can make now a purely empirical model of how to solve this game of chess, right? And the way that that purely empirical model works, we can basically think about this as if you're going to think about uh, a proposal about thinking, that proposal is going to give you some change in board position advantage uh, for some time cost, right? So if you're just going to say, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm going to decide whether I should think in this position, that means I'm going to consider some proposal about like, you know, uh, some increment in board position advantage for some time cost. You can work out what your threshold should be for accepting those proposals, right? And your threshold should be uh, basically you want to remain on the same ISO probability contour. Right, so you want to maintain the same uh, probability of winning. That sort of sets the minimum value of such a proposal that you would accept. And so we can trace out what those ISO probability contours look like, and they have this nice curved form. And then if you follow that optimal policy, that gives you uh, functions for uh, how much time you're going to spend in a given board position that look exactly like the kinds of functions that we saw in the previous slide. So this curvature that we saw in the data is um, is the uh, a consequence of the structure of this um, uh, this relationship between uh, board position advantage and, and time remaining in the game? <coughs> okay. All right. Any other questions about chess? Because I'm now going to switch topics. Can you say again what yeah. is this? This is a bound, right? This is so. So this gives us the decision threshold, and then we can work out what the mean behavior looks like if you then generate from some um, empirical distribution of proposals for this, right? So that, that's what we do in order to make the model, is we say we have some empirical distribution of proposals about how much board position advantage would improve as a consequence of thinking some amount of time. Assume you apply the optimal threshold, and from that we can derive a prediction about how time should vary with board position advantage. Yeah? I may have uh, misunderstood you, but the top figures are uh, co correlation It's, it's showing you, it's the empirical probability that you win the game right. from that combination. Of it doesn't imply causation. That's true. And, the, and we're assuming something causal down here. Yeah. Yeah. But the model still works. <laughs> so, yeah. This is very interesting, but one thing that is still missing is some uh, notion of how. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that something you're trying to attack? To yeah. So, um, so here I just presented you our Oracle results, right? Um, we have a second model that we present in the paper, where um, it, we introduce uh, uncertainty. So the <coughs> so the Oracle model says, I know exactly the um, I know exactly the delta U C values, right? And we can use that to calculate. You know the value of computation, and, and we'll use that to predict people's people's data. Um, we then have another version where what we do is we consider all of the best moves um, that you could make, and then for each of those moves, have a distribution associated with it that has a mean and variance that's determined by this quantity. And so now you sort of the idea is you have some fuzzy idea of how valuable it might be to continue to plan based on the best sort of step one moves that you can see. Um, and you use that to make a decision. And that actually gives us a better fit to the human data than the model, which is just using the article. Um, and then, as I said, what we're currently working on is um, uh, some, some models of uh, how you can actually compute this without having to execute planning, right? And so what, what, what estimate of the value of computation you could get directly from what position? saying 
it's a what position advantage? Oh, I see. This is, um, <clears throat> it's showing that people are, so this is how much people do think. It's not how the quality of the move varies as a consequence of how much they think. So what you're saying is yeah. you're saying, if this was a measure of the quality of the move that people made, I agree that would be weird, right? Because that would be saying they're making a better move. This is just saying, in a situation where it's more valuable to think more, they are thinking more, but that's they're doing that in a saturating way. So like even as that board position advantage, like they could have got, they could have found something really good, and maybe had they planned more, but they didn't because they stopped thinking. Okay. And so, so there's a sense in which I think this, like this is why I was sort of focused on the form of this function is that this seems potentially irrational, right? That you're not thinking as much as it might be useful for you to think in circumstances where it's actually very beneficial for you to think. Um, and in fact, we, we argue that it's, it's a consequence of this. Yeah, that, that depends on yeah, that's right. So this is partly to advertise this is a really cool resource for people who are interested in doing this. Um, we've been putting a lot of work into making this into something which is more usable for behavioral research. Uh, if people are interested, um, feel free to reach out about that. Okay, yeah. Uh, have you looked at whether uh, this ability of detecting when it's valuable to <coughs> spend more time thinking improves winning probability Yeah, we could do that. We haven't done that. Yeah. Because so it's some orthogonal ability. Yeah. Not completely orthogonal, but something yeah. that's not captured by the human. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So we haven't done that, but that's interesting. Okay. All right. Okay, so the second thing I'm going to talk about is now going in a different direction. So this first direction was let's study things that are more complicated because we have more data. Uh, the second one is let's stick with the simple things, but instead of just looking at a few of them, we're going to look at all of them. Um, and so uh, the example I'm going to use here, um, uh, inspired by uh, work from uh, Ido Eros group, is uh, risky choice, right? So this is a familiar problem, I'm sure, to everyone in the room. Uh, making a decision between two different gambles, where those gambles have different outcomes that give you different rewards with different probabilities. Um, and so uh, what our motivation was here is really um, uh, pursuing uh, an idea that um, Ido and his, his colleagues had started to sketch out, which is that the way that we historically have done experimental research um, uh, is sort of something like, a, say, a, a random walk in the space of these kinds of stimuli, right? So you, you can actually go back and sort of look at this, and you can say, okay, if I look at this with my computer scientist uh, eyes, I can say, this is actually a relatively low dimensional stimulus, right? We can think about constructing a space of all possible gambles. That space is parameterized <coughs> by, say, the, um, the different outcomes, the uh, probabilities and the rewards that are associated with those outcomes. We can construct this relatively low dimensional space of these things. And then doing an experiment where you go up and you sort of look at the probability with which people choose one option or the other is basically probing a point in that space. And the thing that we're interested in when we're trying to understand human decision making here is the form of a function which is defined over that space, which maps points in that space, pairs of gambles, to probabilities of making a particular choice. <laughs> um, and so the kind of like data sparse version of doing science in this setting is you know, you sort of test out what people do for a particular gamble, you find something maybe sort of interesting or surprising, you come up with some hypotheses about what it is that they're doing, you have some ideas about what good models of this kind of behavior might be. You use those hypotheses to uh, come up with a gamble that, say, differentiates between those hypotheses. You then test that point in the space, you get some behavior that helps you refine your hypotheses, you come up with some new hypotheses, use those hypotheses to identify another sort of pair of gambles that, that, uh, that would allow you to test that model, you go off and test that point. And so what you're doing is sort of, you know, in this very structured way that's driven by theory, exploring a small set of specific points in the space. 
But um, the point is that nowadays you don't necessarily need to do that, right? So this makes sense if you've got very limited data, but if you're just trying to estimate this function over this space um, and you can get lots of data, an alternative would be just try and cover the entire space in a way that allows you to more efficiently estimate that function. And so we did this in the um, uh, context of risky choice, as I said, inspired by um, work from uh, your errors group. So I think in your original study you had 150 pairs of gambles, and then that went up to 300 in the subsequent studies. Um, uh, and what they were interested in was looking at, if we think about this as computer scientists, can you actually use, say, machine learning models to predict the uh, choices that people make here? Um, and so uh, the conclusion from these initial studies was not really. You could if you introduced appropriate psychological features that were derived from meaningful models of human decision making. Um, but otherwise, machine learning models didn't do very well here. And then we as uh, you know, uh, machine learning researchers were thinking about this and thought, well, maybe this would work better if you just had uh, much more data. <coughs> so this is with Josh Peterson, David Borgen, Lennox Agarwal, and, and Anna Reichman. Um, we just generated much, much more data, right? So using uh, an online recruitment service, we uh, recruited people to um, give us uh, responses for a total of 13,000 pairs of gambles. Um, uh, so in the analysis I'm gonna present, we focus on about 10,000 of those pairs. Um, uh, and so, from this, we get much more data in a way that allows us to, to do a better job of covering that entire space of stimuli. Um, and just to sort of like give a uh, representation of what this looks like. So um, this is taking that you know space of uh, pairs of gambles I was talking about, and now projecting it down to two dimensions using a neural network model. This is sort of the representation that comes out of a neural network model that I'll talk about later. Um, but this is just to give us a sort of two-dimensional representation of what this space looks like. So here, uh, the red dots correspond to the pairs of gambles that were in included in that uh, choice prediction competition. The green crosses are ones that um, Ido and his colleagues had, had flagged as um, uh, corresponding to sort of like historically significant uh, contrasts that had, that have been used for differentiating different kinds of theories of risky choice. And then the black dots are the um, additional stimuli that uh, we added to this set, right? And so you can see we're doing, in some sense, a good job of covering the space. We're sort of picking out, uh, sort of filling in regions between various of the, uh, the previous pairs of gambles that have been explored. Um, but it's also just much more data that we can use for constraining this kind of search for an underlying uh, function that relates these uh, pairs of gambles to, to people's decision probabilities. Well, they're not really interpretable. They just are things that come out of our neural network model. So you know, the 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 thing that is interpretable is that points that are close together in this space are considered similar, similar. in terms of their probabilities. probabilities. Yeah, and and I'll show you some more more informative um, uh, pictures along these lines in, in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, so the thing that we can do when we have that much more data is uh, actually then go out and just exhaustively evaluate models, right? So rather than saying, here's one hypothesis, here's another hypothesis, I'm gonna construct the gamble that differentiates between those, what we can do is now just try and estimate the form of these functions directly. And we do this using some tools that, that come from machine learning. So uh, the way we did this was look at constrained function classes. Um, so uh, we specified a, a, a hierarchy of classes of functions, but then within those constrained function classes, uh, use machine learning methods to allow us to look at unconstrained forms for the, um, the relevant functions that are expressed there. So one of these function classes is our familiar expected utility theory, right? So now, probability that you choose option A, we take as being, um, uh, this is a, you know, in machine learning we call this a softmax function. Um, you, in Economics have all sorts of other ways that you sort of motivate doing this, but this is the way that we uh, we implement this in terms of um, an exponentiated version of uh, an expected value computed in terms of the probability of the outcomes, and then um, sorry, expected utility, and then a, a utility function that's applied to the the payoffs. And this is applied per participant, or this is applied in the, in in all the models I'm going to talk <laughs> about to start with. It's it's applied across all participants, and then I'll show you some individual difference results later. Um, so the idea is that, you know, is that a classically, 
the, form, the way you sort of think about the form of this relationship is you define some parametric function and you estimate the parameters that are associated with that function. Uh, the way that we actually do this is by having our, um, our <coughs> values, the, the payoff values go into a neural network model and then that neural network is outputting something which is then put into this uh, expected utility format, right? So you can kind of think about what we've done here is now construct, use this function class to construct a constrained kind of neural network. Um, and the advantage of doing this is that we can make use of tools that come from machine learning that allow you to train neural networks with arbitrary architectures in a way where we can then um, estimate the form of these functions without putting strong restrictions on the class of the, the utility functions, right? So now we have this very non-parametric way of estimating what the corresponding utility function is. So you train on the data, these yep. Yeah, and when I say train on the data, yeah, the way that we do this is always, um, I'm gonna show you results, those results are always on a held out data set, right? So we train on a subset of the data, we predict the held out subset of the data. Um, we can do the same thing for a functional form that's motivated by prospect theory. So now we also have this function that we estimate for probability weighting. And then we looked at two other classes of models, um, what we call value-based choice models where uh, you have a completely free form function that's taking the probabilities and the outcomes uh, and then combining them together in some arbitrary way, but you're still doing this for individual gambles and then what we call context dependent choice, which is now the completely unconstrained function where it's able to use the features of both of the gambles to uh, decide um, uh, what the probability is of choosing A without making an individual model of the sort of value associated with each of those individual gambles. And then, as I said, we use these machine learning methods to allow us to search within those function classes. Okay, so um, the idea here, uh, and I'll, I didn't talk about it, but I'll also show you results from cumulative prospect theory. But the idea is that we're constructing what we call differentiable decision theories. So we have this nice hierarchy of models, right? So as we go along through this hierarchy, uh, this function class is contained within this one, which is contained within this one, which is contained within this one. So we have this nice hierarchy of models. Um, and that allows us to ask a question about what class of models it seems like human behavior falls into, right? Um, and what assumptions we want to make in order to capture that human behavior. Um, and then the way that those models are implemented is in terms of these computation graphs. So I showed you a sort of simple neural network model. But the idea is that for each of these models, we can sort of draw out this graph that tells you how you combine these operations together in order to produce a final output probability. Um, and then we can use these modern machine learning tools to differentiate back through that, um, that computation graph, and that allows us to then search exhaustively through that, uh, that, that, that space of functions using methods like stochastic gradient descent. Any questions about this? Before question about the diagram. Why is it expected utility a subset of cumulative prospect theory? Um, because cumulative prospect theory has this extra step of the ordering that you impose. So but if you. But the pi function is similar to the expected utility, so the expect is to be a okay. subset. So I think it's, yeah, it's like a non-overlapping set or something like that, right? Because it's, it's, uh, it, so there's a, it's a super set of yeah. expected utility. Okay. Yeah, so we can do that. Just as you understand these diagrams, what's the connection between these diagrams and your network to train, or what are these? Oh, these diagrams are just showing you what a computation graph is, right? So, so this is just, so the, so the, the way that modern machine learning algorithms work, you basically write a piece of code that says, um, for example, I can compute this function d equals a times c. You can specify that in terms of a sequence of operations, right? Um, and so that's your sort of forward model of how that function is computed. And then you give that forward model to an automatic piece of automatic differentiation software, and it returns the derivatives for each of these things, which is then what you need in order to do stochastic gradient. Oh, so that's okay. Yeah, that's all I was trying to yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, <coughs> Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna just show you, first of all, the results for these classic models. So uh, the way I'm gonna show you all the results is in terms of, um, so we, we measure performance using mean squared error, so this is inherited from uh, Ito's choice prediction competition. So we're looking at the mean squared error between the probabilities that the, the um, model is producing and the um, probabilities that people produce. Uh, on a given problem, and then this is aggregated across all the problems, and then um, 
but you get the same results if you use like a, a log like here. Um, so uh, this is performance of the model, so lower is better, as a function of the proportion of our data set that's used to train that model. And then all of these gray lines correspond to expected utility models that humans came up with, right? So different sort of ways that you could parameterize that function. Uh, and then finding the best fitting parameters using our data set. Uh, and then the blue line is the model that the machine learning algorithm discovers, right? And so from about 20% of the data set, you've, you've found something which is, you know, um, at least as good as the best sort of proposals for the form of that function that, that human uh, researchers have found. Um, what this looks like is kind of what you might expect that it looks like, right? So this is the utility function, and this is the subjective probability. Um, for uh, prospect theory, you see a similar thing. Now there's more gray lines because you have both the form of our um, uh, su subjective value function and also the form of the subjective probability function. Um, and so this is sort of the cross product of those two things. But again, if we get enough data, then the model has found a, a form for those functions, which is better than um, all the things that humans have found. When we look at this, this sort of looks like what we expect. This doesn't look like what we expect. This is the probability function. And uh, later in the talk, I'm going to explain what's going on with this. But, but again, this is for an aggregate. We do yep. think of these theorems as described in a single person. Yep. We don't necessarily actually expect that or be average to be across the population. I have some utility function. You have some utility function. It's not the same. What you're basically saying is that let's look at everyone together yep. and, and see what's yeah. And, and part of that is a constraint from the particular data set that we have, right? So because we're doing this in this... Well, obviously, yeah. we had like 10,000 choices for a singular person. So, And I'll show you a data set that we have later on that allows us to engage with that. Yeah. <coughs> um, and this is showing all of the models that I talked about. Um, so now trained on the entire data set. So these are the ones that I just showed you, the classic models. If we just remove the constraints of those functional forms and we just have our value-based model that does this, if we remove all constraints, it does this, right? Um, and then this is a model, this is um, uh, the model that won that original choice prediction competition. Um, so this is uh, best estimate and sampling tools from Ido's group. Um, they subsequently pointed out, so we weren't able to retrain this model on our data set, but they pointed out that if you take a linear transformation of it, you actually get a nice improvement in performance and it sort of moves down to about here. So uh, it does extremely well on this data set, um, as well as, you know, almost as well as the sort of most flexible models that we're able to train on the data set. Um, so there's a couple of things to take away from here, right? So one is, um, this is the previous largest data set. This is the choice prediction competition data set. And if we look at the choice prediction competition data set, sort of draw this line here, you get the same conclusion, which is that the best human generated models are still better than the best machine learning models, because there's just not really enough data for us to, to estimate these machine learning models effectively. And you can see that cumulative prospect theory um, is the best model with a relatively small amount of data here. Um, uh, and um, you know, I think that's sort of consistent with this being a very popular model uh, in the community, where, where if you're trying to you know, account for choices with a small amount of data, this is a really good kind of inductive bias to have. But as we get more data, it's possible to estimate models that are better than this. Um, and we still end up with uh, a little bit of a gap between the most flexible model we find and the, the best uh, human model. <coughs> so the next question you could have is like, what's contributing to that? Um, and what we found was that we can actually find a, a model that's in this function class, this context dependent function class, that gives us performance that's um, as good as this context-dependent model when trained on the full data set, but achieves that level of performance much earlier. Um, and so this is a model which assumes that what we're actually seeing in the data set is something that we can express in terms of a mixture of uh, these classic theories. And so the basic idea behind this model is that the way that we set it up, we create a model that has two components um, uh, that it can choose for the utility function and for the probability weighting function. And so those two components correspond to one component that's sort of an expected utility-like component and one component that's like a, um, uh, a um, prospect theory-like component. Um, and what we assume is rather than one of these models being the model that's going to account for all of the data, 
rather we allow that on a <coughs> per choice problem basis you're, you have different weights that you assign to these different utility functions and to these different probability weighting functions. And so the idea is that basically it, it, the model is one that says, assumes that you have a kind of heterogeneity across the space of choice problems in terms of the extent to which you're going to exhibit things like loss aversion or the overweighting of, of low probabilities. And so this model does extremely well. Um, so here's that context dependent model that I showed you before. Uh, and then here's a model which is this mixture of theories model which is estimated from the data. Um, and what you can see is that it achieves this very high level of performance with very small amounts of data because all that it's doing is estimating this you know, sort of two sets of binary weightings across that space of problems um, and it's able to do that from, from very little data. And so yeah. Distillation, basically. Well, to see w if there are simple ways to extract how the weight would depend on the yeah. number. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think that would be a so. so um, we did some preliminary analysis. So, so this is I was saying sort of slightly more informative pictures of what's going on in this space, right? So this is this is that original representation space that I showed, and then this is points in this space are now colored by which um, probability weighting function they use and which. Um, uh, utility function they use, um, and then this is showing there's a subset of the gambles in the space which is dominated gambles, and so this is this is those are sort of found by the model and organized together. Uh, people are not, um, people don't always recognize those, and, um, but uh, but they're sort of clustered together in this space, and you can see this here. So the 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 coloring here shows you okay, like here's a sort of subset of the problems where you see overweighting of small small probabilities. Here's uh, you know, a subset of the problems where you see um, uh, loss aversion. <coughs> and so you can see that these things are sort of non-uniformly <coughs> spread across the space. So we did some preliminary analyses to try and figure out what are the factors that are contributing to one of these being used. And so there are some things like um, the, the number of outcomes is a predictor of the extent to which you show overweighting of small probabilities, right? So if you have like, 99% and 1%, then you tend to overweight the 1%. If you have 99% and 1% and 2% and other, you know, like you, so you have a whole bunch of things, then you tend to overweight less. And this is consistent with some other work people have done on circumstances under which you, know, you see this kind of uh, overweighting of small probabilities. So we dug into this a little bit, but yeah, I, we don't have a nice, simple explanatory theory for what the factors are. Yeah. More flexible process going on that is well filtered by the I think I think I think it's my my guess is it's probably something more like the latter, but I I don't we can't say something about that on the basis but of the data. But then is it a disaster? What do we learn from it? So what we learn from it is I, the way that I would think about this is um, it shows us that if you think about what that historical literature was trying to do, it was asking which of these theories is correct, and that was the wrong question to ask because the answers are more along the lines of where are these theories correct? Because there are parts of the problem space where some of these things are true and parts of the problem space where other things are true. And so if you went into this and said, one of these models is right, which of these models is right, here's my gamble that t tests which of these things is true, you're gonna get the wrong answer, right? Um, and so we have, you know, the two takeaways are, we have this nice, very simple model that actually you can train on a small amount of data and get very good predictive performance for people's decisions, right? Um, and that what that tells us about our sort of like classical questions are that we shouldn't be asking which is right, we should be asking where are they right, right? I think those are the things I focus on. But, uh, Tom, but uh, so this is correct if you're limited to the popular model in economics. Yeah. But if you were willing to consider this, then you don't have to assume different model for different tasks. That's true. Because it fits it almost on the money. Even, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, that's right. So, and um, a, we should we should say Ido has a nice explanatory model that does. Yeah, like <laughs> <So if laughs> as you I said, really almost. If you want to well. use expected utility theory, then yeah. you have to 
that's a good question. I can't <coughs> answer that. Yeah, that's right. So if you, and it's just it's just just constant probability across the space, yeah. and we're seeing some sampling differentiation. Function. Yeah, I mean there is some systematicity here, right? That's what's being reflected right, right, in right, this. But, but that's, that's a good question. Yeah. The second question: You could you could have a mixture of con context dependent. You do even better, right? Um, <laughs> but you need more more data, right? So so yes, I think I, I think if you, you you can look at the context dependent model, you can see these models have asymptoted. Mm -hmm. Context dependent is still going down. So if you got another 10 times as much data, you're going to be able to do even better than this, right? And something like this kind of, like if you look <coughs> at, this is basically what people are now doing in machine learning is um, they've got to the point where they've run out of ideas for different kinds of models. And so they're, they're doing um, mixtures of experts, which just means you take, you know, 10 copies of the same model and you train it so they become specialized in different parts of the space and they behave in different ways. And then, yeah, you should be able to do it. All right, so, uh, so this question about individual differences, we collected another data set. That, so this, this first data set wasn't worthwhile for looking at individual differences because we had varying numbers of responses per person. They could be as few as 20 responses per person. It wasn't enough to be able to fit those models. Um, we collected another data set that had um, 3,000 individuals for whom we had a much more consistent sets of responses over a longer period. Um, and. Uh, what I'm showing you here is an analysis using that mixture of theories model to look at this, <laughs> where we can do the same kind of analysis um, with these different utility functions and probability weighting functions, um, uh, but now fit those on an individual basis. Um, uh, some stuff that happens when you do this, because you've got small samples, you get some weird stuff happening, right? So Mike was asking about monotonicity. Here's one person who seems to have inverted the scale, right? Um, uh, but what it gives us is this sort of picture of what at least a distribution of responses looks like, and, and we can do a good job of, of characterizing that individual level basis. Did you constrain the first probability function using that? Or is that this one is constrained to be linear, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, and this is also the explanation for why we saw that weird probability weighting function before, right? So a mixture of these ends up looking like that little bump that we saw. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions about? So, so what I would predict is that you should be able to find lotteries where individuals would be less risk averse, right? Consistent with with the patterns that we're seeing here. Um, but that's interesting. Yeah. When you look at the um, decision problems for which people are more likely to use one of the functions or another, is it related to <laughs> what choices those functions predict? In other words, you're more say more likely to use prospect. So I, we could look in our data. I don't know the answers to that off the top of my head. OK. Um, so this data set uh, is published. It's called the Choices 13K data set. Um, you can download it, play with it, pick your own models. Uh, here's a cool paper that used our data set to do something fun, which is they took um, a large language model, um, like GPT-style model, uh, and then they trained it on our data set, so they made sort of text descriptions of our decision problems, put them into the large language model, and then fine-tuned it with a linear model to predict people's responses. So they're basically getting an embedding for the decision problems from the large language model, and then uh, generating a prediction about it. It turns out that this model actually does pretty well, right? So here you can see um, uh, comparable to um, Ido's uh, Beast model um, using this sort of text-based representation of these choice problems. So, um, you know, uh, I think this is mostly um, the, the main advantage that you get from this is that you can then use this same model, which has been calibrated uh, on the human data, and now use it to make predictions about other text-based um, decision problems that are not the, in the format that they were presented. 
<laughs> uh, that already happened. So um, it's worse on Mechanical Turk, but um, we, we can, um, uh, I have a former student who has a company that is good at detecting <laughs> these kinds of things, and so um, I'm not too worried about it. It just means we already do a lot of things. I, one thing I haven't talked about in this talk is there's a lot of methodological things you have to do to make sure that you're getting reasonable data. Even doing those things, the data we got were noisier than the data that Ido got in the lab, and that was one of the factors that was different in our data set than their data set. Um, uh, and I think it's just another thing that we have to add to our ways that we filter data. Yeah. All, right. All right. All right, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is how we can make use of these large online populations to do a, a, a different kind of thing, which is running experiments on things that we really couldn't run experiments on before, or at least you know, laboratory-style experiments, um, and that's simulating social phenomena. So um, with Tom Morgan and Jordan Suchow, we uh, created this um, uh, platform called Dallinger. It's a software platform that you can use for running uh, simulations of cultural evolution online. Um, it's named after the Reverend William Dallinger, who ran the first experiments on biological evolution in the lab. So this is Dallinger's apparatus. He made this device that could be sort of heated up and cooled down and showed that uh, he could, by gradually increasing the temperature on a population of bacteria, evolve a population of bacteria that was stable at a uh, higher temperature and then would die out if he uh, changed the temperature back to the original temperature which that population had, um, had developed. Um, so uh, we wanted to be able to do the same kind of thing, but with humans, not necessarily raising their temperature, <laughs> but um, being able to explore how it is that uh, information spreads in communities of people and what the consequences of that are for people's decisions. Um, and so what Dallinger does is it basically automatically uh, schedules participants, runs experiments, and issues reimbursement on these, these services. So it's basically, it sort of puts all of these pieces together so that you can write a little experiment script. That experiment script is delivered to a person, but the data from that experiment goes back to the server, and the choices that an individual makes can influence the choices that somebody else makes in the future. So the way to think about this is, what it does is it treats an individual human decision as an atomic unit, and then you specify a logic by which you're building a graph of these decisions, where an edge between two decisions would indicate that the outcome of one person's decision influences the decision problem that we pose to the next person. And so, this, you can use this as a very general framework for then setting up things where one person's decision influences another, and we can look at what those consequences are down the line. Sure. Yep. What's the biggest advantage compared to old people? Um, the way that I think about this is there's a lot of things that you can do for like running sort of group experiments and for running games between individuals and so on. Um, <coughs> there's a nice um, figure that Abdullah Amatuk makes, which is kind of like like ease of use versus generality. Dallinger is the hardest to use but most general of these things, where it really, um, it, I said atomic unit because that's the way that it's set up, so it, it's really set up so that you can make arbitrary relationships between the decisions that one person makes and the problem that's posed to another person. Uh, and so it's more general than a lot of other things, but as a consequence it's also just much more complicated to make those experiments. You'll, you'll see how this works in the experiments. Yeah. Um, but you can think about this as we call it programs with people, right? So you can write an algorithm where you can specify the control structures and all of these things uh, and, you know, um, and then put that, um, uh, turn that into something which is then run as, as an experiment with human participants. So um, I'm going to show you two experiments. The first of these is an experiment um, on the effects of social transmission on bias. Uh, and so this was really motivated by a lot of um, arguments and then uh, empirical observations that it seems like social media was uh, increasing polarization online. Um, and so what we wanted to do was just see whether we could actually test this out experimentally. And this is joint work with Matt Hardy, Bill Thompson, and Pete Kraft. Um, it, was, it was just accepted at Nature Human Behavior. So the way that we did this, because we're psychologists, we took this incredibly interesting phenomenon and we boiled it down to the least interesting task we could come up with, right? So the way that our task works, people are making a decision about whether there are more blue dots or more green dots on the screen. Um, but we manipulate a couple of things about this. So one is a subset of our participants in the social conditions <coughs> see information about um, the, uh, uh, the responses of a bunch of other people who've seen that stimulus, right? So they see that uh, six out of eight previous workers um, 
uh, chose emerald, right, the, the green color, because they thought that there was more green dots than blue dots. The other thing that we manipulate is how people are paid. So they get one payment which is based on their accuracy, whether they get the right answer for there being more blue dots or green dots. But a subset of our participants also just get an extra payment for uh, the number of green dots. So they just want there to be more green dots because they're going to get paid more. Or they get paid based on the number of blue dots. But this creates a, a motivated reasoning bias. So um, we show empirically that this actually um, uh, is enough that it makes people just sort of that much more inclined to think that there are more green dots if they're just getting paid based on the number of green dots that show up. Um, and so we can and then look at how these two things interact. Independent yep. Of choice? yep, independent of their choice. Yep. Yeah, it turns out this is a very nice, simple manipulation if you want to just get people to produce something which is an irrational bias, but one that's sort of representative of the kinds of things that um, you, might, you might imagine seeing elsewhere. Yeah. How do you know that they can produce that they can if they won't get Because uh, they're, um, they, I, can, I can show you in the result, their accuracy is not affected by this. They just, they just, they just want there to be more. So this even overpowers hedging. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, in our results, yes. Yeah. And I'll show you the results. Okay, yeah. And the screen is that six of eight workers, it's the previous eight. Yeah, so right. the way that it works. I mean, it's, not, it's not eight that were cherry-picked. No, that's right, yeah. So we, so, so we now set this up in a sort of mini social network. Uh, so in our social network, we have a sequence of generations of people. Um, each generation makes their judgments. Uh, that information is aggregated. Every individual, the next generation observes responses. The previous generation communicated in that way, and then we can look at how information is flowing through these generations by this social transmission. Um, and so, when we run this experiment, we have um, uh, a social network is eight generations of eight people, so it's sixty-four mm -hmm. people. Um, we then ran ten replications of these mini social networks in each of four conditions, where we cross whether they have the motivated reasoning bias and whether they have access to social information, right? And so we can then look at the consequences of those two things. And so that's what this looks like. This is just showing uh, people's accuracy over successive generations. And so um, uh, the, the green and blue, these are the social conditions. The red and the gray, these are the asocial conditions. But just having access to social information increases your accuracy, right? So this is a good thing about being in a social network is that just, you know, as you would expect, you can do social learning, you can get information from other people's responses, um, but it also increases bias. So here, the, um, the red and the blue are the two conditions where we have the motivated reasoning bias, um, and uh, the blue is the case where we are in the social network with the motivated reasoning bias, and so just being in that social network magnifies this response bias, um, uh, in a way that you know, it's a consequence of information spreading through that network. And so we have a, a nice sort of simple model of this. I think the way that you can think about it, um, if you imagine you've got these two sources of evidence, you've got your perceptual evidence and then you've got the evidence that's provided by the, the rest of the people in the group, and you're doing a sort of Bayesian integration of these things. If, you, uh, if everyone is biased, then that creates a situation where that bias is being transmitted through the social information you're receiving, and so then that creates the situation where, at each point, if you're just doing your sort of Bayesian updating, you're updating not just based on the information that the previous people had, but also based on the bias that they had, and so you're effectively kind of like double counting that bias, um, and so that magnifies the bias that individuals have. Yeah. Are, are your subjects told what uh, previous generations? They, well, they're just told some other people who did the same task as you. So, so if, 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 if you were given a bonus, you know that they were given yeah. a bonus too. Yeah. Uh, so, so it, it mm -hmm. might be interesting to see uh, what happens when the um, objectives change. Yeah. So we um, uh, we were we were interested in how can you counter this effect, right? And we we ran a lot of pilot studies where we looked at interventions where we were like having disclaimers and you know like these people were paid based on green or whatever and none of these things worked 
And so what we ended up deciding was that um, rather than making an intervention which was based on trying to modify the cognitive states of the agents, we could do an intervention which was based on trying to modify the communication protocols, right? So if you think about it, there's a, um, if, you, if you think about a social network, one of the decisions that the, like in an online social network, one of the decisions the company makes is about who is represented in your, you know, your feed, right? So they're making these algorithmic decisions normally based on questions about how do I maximize engagement? How do I maximize the probability people stick around and click on ads? Um, so we said, well, what if we instead wanted to try and construct your feed in a way that would help you to be less biased? What's a way that we can solve that problem? Um, and so the way that we solve this problem is by using an algorithm I talked about yesterday, which is the important sampling algorithm, right? We have exactly the situation that we had yesterday. Yeah? It should also depend on how accurate I think other people are, right? Like how much you use their information. Yeah, you could tell how them, much I it, use it, it, but, but, but if you want to have these... So is there a way to manipulate right. how much... You could, you could tell them just ignore the other people, but then you would lose the accuracy benefit that you get from. So we want to preserve accuracy while reducing bias. Yeah. I'm just confused. How come uh, they are more biased but also better? Um, it's because of the way that we balance the stimuli that we use in our task. So the stimuli was actually biased? No, it was, it was balanced so that um, uh, you could you could have a response bias, but you could still also be more accurate. So we we constructed it, unlike the real world, everything was sort of like perfectly set up so that you still had some room to move in your responses. So that we weren't disincentivizing people from being biased. Yeah. Okay. So um, so the idea here is that uh, we have a situation where you're seeing samples from uh, a distribution. We actually but it's a bias distribution. We actually want samples from this other distribution, right? And so this is exactly the analog of the problem we talked about yesterday, where you want to get generate samples from P, you can only generate samples from Q. How do you fix that problem? The solution is that you reweight those samples, right? And you reweight them in proportion to this ratio of P to Q. And so that's what we did. So we can actually take our data, we can, on an individual basis, estimate a model, which is an et gives us an individual level estimate of how biased a person is. And then we can take those individual um, models, and then we can remove the bias term from the model. And from that, we kind of get the unbiased model of that person. And then we can use something that's called multiple important sampling, because this is a situation where now we have samples from a bunch of Qs, and we want to get back to us some samples from a bunch of Ps. Uh, we, can, we can do that by then Reweighting people's responses based on the ratio between how probable it is for that person under their biased distribution versus how probable it would be under their unbiased distribution. Um, I'm not going to go into details about how we did that, but we basically um, we use some methods from um, uh, that are that are used in psychometrics to to make a, a nice model of this. But it's something which can generalize to other domains where you can you can measure bias on an individual level. And so we then. Uh, construct a version of our task where instead of just seeing the eight people from the previous generation with probability uniform, right, for each of those people, we just sort of, re instead of reproducing those statistics directly, you see those statistics where we sample from this weighted distribution. And so the idea is now the way you're constructing your social media feed, you're going to upweight people who are producing behaviors that are more representative of the unbiased population and downweight people who are producing behaviors that are more biased, okay? But you, um, and so, so we're still transmitting the social information, but you're sort of, you have a higher probability of getting transmitted if you're acting in a way which is less biased. Uh, yeah? Does the recipient now understand this, or they think they're getting They think that they're getting the uh, uniform sampling, yeah. Um, and so this intervention, so now we've got, I'm just gonna show you these, the mean results of these three conditions. So we ran three different conditions, the asocial motivated condition that we had before and the social motivated condition we had before. So this is a replication of the bias effect. Uh, and then this is our social resampling condition. And so we're able to mitigate the bias effect while retaining the same level of accuracy that we get from the social information. How does this experiment translate into a real-life story? Here, it's, it's clear what bias means. Yep. So, 
so I, th I think you can do the same uh, thing. Like, so if you are Twitter or Facebook or wherever it is, right, you can look at what people are endorsing, you know, what they're retweeting or liking or whatever it is, and you can get a distribution from that. And then you can use that to construct an individual level estimate of how biased they are in terms of the spectrum of content. And you can, rather than promoting their posts uniformly, you promote the posts that are more so representative. So bi of bias here is endogenously determined by yep. the distribution. Yep. Yep. Well, we should go maximize bias. It's not that Twitter wants to minimize it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, our algorithm, you, you would have to construct another proxy distribution that's your target distribution. But you could do it, yeah. You, it, would, it would be reweighting in the same way. But you'd say, I want this distribution rather than this distribution. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the most crazy thing that we've done, which is running evolutionary simulations with people, right? So uh, previously, if you wanted to sort of study evolutionary dynamics, you kind of had to do this on computers. You would make like an agent-based model where you know maybe some information or genetic materials getting transmitted across successive generations, and you have an evolutionary algorithm that's telling you how to select who the descendants of a uh, particular uh, person would be. Um, we uh, you know, are used to running all sorts of different kinds of psychology studies that have different kinds of structures, but using our software, we can now basically take any agent-based simulation and translate it into a simulation that we run with humans. And so the idea is, let's take an evolutionary simulation, run it with humans, and then use this as a tool for trying to answer questions about um, what, what are the factors that, that matter in, say, processes of cultural evolution. Um, and what we were interested in, in particular was uh, the transmission of technologies and the development of uh, better technologies. So if we think about uh, things like coming up with better stone tools, people who went to the uh, museum got to see a bunch of these cool stone tools. Um, or coming up with navigation methods, or coming up with methods for, for baking bread. All of these have this character, which is that they have this complex multi-step process involved. Um, and if you mess up part of that process, the outcome that you get isn't necessarily that great. So we were interested in how is it that these kind of complex cognitive algorithms um, evolve through processes of cultural transmission. And in particular, how is it that we're able to come up with and sustain new ideas that might be counterintuitive ideas relative to our current beliefs about how things work. So uh, this is joint work with Bill Thompson, Bastard Offiston, and, and Ted Summers. Um, we did this using uh, a very simple algorithmic task, uh, which anybody who's taken an introductory computer science class will be very familiar with. So um, we gave people a set of images. Uh, and then unbeknownst to people, these images had numbers associated with them. And their task was, by clicking on pairs of images, um, if you click on two images and uh, they're out of order with respect to this numbering, they'll switch places. If they're in order, they'll stay in the same place. And so the task was put the images into the order, which corresponds to these numbers that people don't know, um, with as few comparisons as possible. Okay? So we're basically giving people the challenge of coming up with a sorting algorithm. And so this is a nice analog of those things I was talking about before because people have to come up with a multi-step procedure. Um, they then would, in our experiment, do this task. They have to describe what they did in a way that might make sense to somebody else and create some demonstrations of the procedure that they followed. And we could look at how the algorithms that they came up with were transmitted <coughs> across successive generations. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can solve this sorting problem. You can actually construct an optimal program for sorting six objects, um, uh, which is extremely counterintuitive and complicated. Um, but the kinds of algorithms that um, uh, humans come up with uh, we can organize into these different kinds. I'm just going to focus on two algorithms. One of these is called gnome sort, and the other is called selection sort. These numbers correspond to the score of those algorithms using the metric that we used, which is how many steps it takes to solve these sorting problems. So uh, gnome sort is the sort of most performant algorithm, um, but it's more complicated than selection sort. And so selection sort is a nice intuitive algorithm that does pretty well. So. Uh, here's a description from one of our participants about how you selection sort. Basically, they say, I started with the first picture, then clicked on picture two, then back to one, then picture three, then back to one, then picture four, and so on. After I was done with the first picture, I started with the second, and went second picture to three, second to four, and so on. I did this till I was at the end. 
so from that description, you probably now understand how this selection sort works. You're basically doing these pairwise comparisons to the first object, and then you do it to the second object, and so on. Uh, and as I said, this does a sort of reasonable job of sorting our objects. Gnome sort's a bit more complicated to describe. It says, begin with comparing the second picture to the picture on the left. Once it stops moving, move on to the third picture, compare it with the pictures to the left until it stops moving. Move on to the fourth picture, compare it with the pictures to the left, then move on to the fifth picture and compare it with the pictures on the left. Finally, choose the sixth picture and compare it with the pictures on the left. Once the sixth picture stops moving, the picture should be in numerical order. Right? Okay. So that's a little more complicated. It's actually a better algorithm. It sorts these uh, lists more efficiently. Um, but it requires you to sort of keep track of a little bit more information when you're trying to solve this sorting problem. And so what we were interested in was what are the circumstances under which more complex but more performant algorithms could take over the, the population of, of learners. And in order to explore this, um, we manipulated one thing, which was uh, basically um, what someone who studies cultural evolution would think of as selection. So we ran our behavioral experiment uh, in a way where um, People would uh, come in, as I said, they would get to see some descriptions from other people, they would get to see the demonstrations from those other people, they'd then do the task, they'd generate descriptions and demonstrations, and the one thing that we manipulated across our two conditions was whether the scores that people got on the task were visible when you were making a decision about who you were going to learn from. Okay? So you can think about this as just like, you're gonna learn from three people, they could be three random people that you learn from, or you can see how well those people did and you can make a decision about whether you want to learn from the people who are getting the best performance. And so this was one small tweak to the sort of protocol of interaction between people was just whether you had visible information about how well people were doing the thing that you're trying to learn to do. Um, and so we then ran 10 populations of 12 generations of 15 people in our crazy experiment where um, uh, people are then implementing something like this sort of Know, fitness algorithm in selecting who it is that they're going to learn from. Um, so I'm going to show you results just uh, broken down. I'm going to sh uh, show you some, some graphs where we look at uh, all of the kinds of sorting algorithms that people use. Remember, gnome sorts in red, selection sorts in green. Uh, I'm going to first of all just show you one of our populations. So as I said, we had uh, 10 different populations in these two different conditions, random mixing where you're just choosing three people at random and selective social learning where you're getting to choose who you learn from uh, uh, based on their scores. And then each of the colors here, so these correspond to, each of these, these shapes corresponds to one participant. Um, and then the green triangles are selection sorters um, and the red squares are gnome sorters. And then the others correspond to different algorithms that, that people came up with. And then the way that I'm constructing these lineages is for each person, I'm connecting them back to the highest scoring person that they learned from. So you can use this to sort of make one parent for each person in the population. But what you should be able to see is that in our random mixing population, even though some individuals came up with the more counterintuitive but uh, more effective algorithm, it never spread through the population. Right? Whereas in our selective social learning population, uh, you can see that uh, uh, when this was discovered, it was able to spread and be maintained throughout that population. Okay. So when someone chose to learn from someone that did their known sort, <coughs> how do you convey that information? You decided to describe the algorithm? The, and the, the participants generated descriptions and demonstrations, and they were incentivized to do a good job because they were paid partly based on the performance of people who learned from them. Okay, so it's the verbal description, the text yeah. list. They they just they just saw a numerical score, uh, so they, they had a they had a moves? they had a chance to do the uh, the the task and then they saw the, the how much that person had basically been paid for their performance in the previous experiment. So the difference between left and right is that people on the right have some form of assurance that the information they're getting is they, legitimate. They, so everyone has the chance to choose from a population of people from the previous generation. So there's like 15 people in the previous generation. They get from, right? And then they're going to choose to learn from three. And the only difference is, in one case, you don't know how well those people did, and in the other case, you do. Oh, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So they yeah. have a label that's the same. That yeah. Really that's right. That's really good because the yeah. guy. Yeah. So, so this confidence is that's right. in the information. I, I think one way of thinking about it is that it's giving them the incentive to overcome how hard it is to figure out how that algorithm works, right? 
Um, and that small tweak is enough for this then to take over the population. And so this is, this is all of our random mixers, and this is all of our selective social learners, and you can see it's, you know, it's sort of very evident in the results um, uh, that the only cases where you sort of get the, the more counterintuitive uh, but better algorithm taking over is in the case where you uh, have the selective social learner. Yeah. What is the grade selection here? Is that uh, this is, um, those are our, uh, those are other algorithms that I'm not labeling as differentiated algorithms. So algorithm better than the known was only the optimal one. Um, so there's nothing better than the known, that's why they, there's no. The, yeah, that's right, they're sort of, they're maxing out here. So the, so the optimal algorithm is, is what's called a sorting circuit, and so it's, it's very, um, it's not something you can describe in a uh, short sequence of steps like that, it's like, if the outcome of this comparison is this, then do this. If the outcome of this comparison is this, then do this. Yeah. And so nobody learned it. Nobody figured it out on their own. No, it took my postdoc like a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happened to the actual situation? Uh, oh, this one? Yeah. So, so this is a case where it didn't take over. You can see it's sort of starting to happen down here, but um, the big problem is that nobody in this network. Same here, right? No individuals are coming up with it, and so it, it's not having a chance to take over. Yeah. Were you surprised that so many people learned the GNOME sorting? Because it seems complex by just trying to read it. Yeah, I mean, they were incentivized. They get paid some money for getting a good. There were no visuals. Um, they said so there was a demonstration, too. So you get uh, a text description and a demonstration of you right. executing it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. was it run on Amtrak or for This was run on Amtrak. Yeah, I wouldn't. It doesn't. I wouldn't run it on Amtrak today. So, yeah. so do you have any demographics? Uh, this was basically the entire Amtrak population. So we had like four thousand participants in this experiment. So it's like the entire active Amtrak population. Yeah, because it's also surprising to me that they did so well. Were the descriptions kind of just like in a good quality language? Um, yeah, I mean, you saw like people. Like I said, people were incentivized not just for their own performance, but also for the performance of subsequent people. And so, like, you would get more money for free if your algorithm was used by a bunch of other people. Okay, um, okay so that's it. So, uh, high level conclusions, right? So, with more data, we can use more naturalistic stimuli, cover entire stimulus spaces, and explore social dynamics. I mean, I think the point of this talk is really to get you to think creatively about different kinds of questions that we can be asking as a consequence of having access to more data of this kind. Um, I think there's also a, another sort of meta level point here, which is that as we get more data, we should also expect the nature of our theories to change, right? And so this is something I think about a lot in the context of psychology. Um, I think economics has been in a world where you've had a lot of data in certain settings for a long time. But I think there's a bias in psychology to try and find nice, simple explanatory theories. Um, and there's a sense in which we should not expect that to be the norm as we get more data, right? So because of the bias variance trade-off, right? Uh, as you get more data, you're going to have more s sort of more systematicity in that data that can be, ju that can be used to justify more complex models. Um, and so uh, as a consequence, we are going to be coming up with more complicated explanations for the behaviors that we see because that's going to be the thing that sort of falls out of the data that we have. Um, we are also going to need uh, to have more help in making sense of more data, right? So things like machine learning algorithms that we can use for trying to search through spaces of theories and things like that, um, those become available as a consequence of having larger data sets, uh, but they also maybe become more necessary. Um, so. We've now done a lot of these large-scale experiments in different settings. We always go into them saying, hey, let's definitively figure out, is it theory A that's true or theory B that's true? You know, we'll sort of nail that down <laughs> once and for all. And then we run the experiment, and we always come back and we say, well, actually, it turns out it's more complicated than that. And I think that's just what happens as you start to deal with you know, situations where we have larger data sets like this. But there's, there's, there's cost to uh, those more complex theories. Yeah. Well, we saw we saw right. <laughs> this is the, this is the this is the cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, and for the experiment.
I'm but so, but I think that's, I mean, I think there's, there are sort of compromises, right, where you can say, here are the basic principles, but the thing that I'm going to allow is that those are, say, variable throughout the space, right, rather than being uniformly true or something like that, right? Um, so, yeah, I think we should still hope for, like, like the way I think about it is, we're going to be able to pull out simple things at some level of abstraction, but we're also going to be recognizing that there's more complex things going on in the data sets as well, right? And so we should not take the fact that there are complex things going on too as invalidating the simple generalizations that hold across a large amount of the data, right? And I think for people who are just used to looking for simple explanations, that's an uncomfortable thing to do, right? Sort of like recognizing that we're going to be having theories that are expressed at different levels of abstraction based on the level of precision that we want to capture in our data. Yeah. Yeah. I want to uh, propose a more optimistic summary of what you said. Maybe what the big data uh, data set help us do is maybe reduce some of the working assumptions that we base our research. And maybe after reducing some of the working assumptions, maybe we will find some simplicity. But if you only start with expected utility theory plus some biases, mm -hmm. maybe you will not get to that simplicity. Yeah. You're, you're going to have the chance to present your, uh <laughs> 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 your version of this tomorrow. <laughs> so you can convince us. All right. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs>